His love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a vast His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns His face away, as wounds with Martha chosen one, bring many sons to glory. sin upon his shoulders, ashamed I hear my mocking voice, call out among the scoffers, it was my sin that held him there, until it was accomplished, his dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I Boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart: His words have paid my ransom. Thank you. you may be seated. Would you join me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, I just pray that you will be with Josh as he brings us the morning message, Father, that you've laid on his heart. I pray, Lord, that you will open our ears to hear what Josh has to say, because it's your words, Father. I pray that you will just clear the clutter that is going on inside of us and help us to be focused on what Josh has to say. Just ask a special blessing upon Josh. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Keith. Good morning, church. Thank you, worship team. So if you're new with us this morning, we've been going through the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter by chapter, and today we'll be ending with Ephesians chapter 6 with the armor of God. And so if you are able, will you please stand for the reading of today's scripture? Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord, and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and then with your feet fitted in readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given, may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. 
for which I'm an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare and fearlessly as I should. Will you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, I just thank you today, God, that we could come and worship you in this house, Father. Lord, I thank you that we are here worshiping you freely without persecution. And so, Father God, I pray today that our eyes be open to see what you have for us and our ears be open to hear what you have for us, God. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. A little background on who is speaking here in the book of Ephesians. We know as the Apostle Paul, who is an apostle in the first century church. You see, Paul, he was accused of telling people to rebel against the state of Rome. He was beaten, arrested, and he was almost assassinated. He was also shipwrecked and placed under house arrest. Most of us would call this a hard life. He had to go through emotional things and physical things and mental things. But while he was imprisoned in Rome for two years under the watchful eye of Roman soldiers, he must have had made an impression on Paul. These Roman soldiers must have oppressed him in some way. You see, he saw the soldier's armor enough to become well acquainted with it. He learned from it and he understood each meaning behind each piece and what that piece served and why it was important. At some point, he must have noticed that as his armor is important to the Roman soldiers, it's also important to Christians as well. You see, the Roman soldiers wear their armor to fight in their physical wars, but we as Christians should also wear our armor as we fight in spiritual wars. Paul sets the scene for us. We are fighting a war, and the stakes are higher than they have ever been before. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 through 6 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, from pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. You see this morning, church, we have an enemy, and our enemy is not the people sitting beside you. It is not flesh and blood, but we have an adversary. And our adversary and our enemy is Satan and the devil and his host of demons. And they have a single driving purpose. Their single driving purpose is to take out the children of God. Their purpose is to disrupt kingdom work from being done. And their purpose is to draw division among brothers and sisters in Christ. Their purpose is to spread lies and rumors to cause chaos. And their purpose is to drive division among the churches. And their purpose is to kill, steal, and destroy all joy and hope in people's lives. You see, every day we are all faced with different cares of this world and different responsibilities. So often we forget that we're in a battle. But make no mistake, our spiritual lives and the future of God's kingdom, they are on the line this morning. If we lose this war, we lose everything. So what can we do? in the face of overwhelming odds to be ready for this battle that we are in. Is there any hope? Paul has the answer to this question. Ephesians 6.13 says, He gives us the call to arms. By putting on the armor of God, we can be assured that we can outstand anything the devil can throw our way. So where do we start? How will we be ready when God gives us the call to battle? We start with the belt of truth. You see, the belt in the Roman army was known as a cingulum. It played a crucial role in the effectiveness of a soldier's armor. It was the belt that held the sheath. It was the sheath that held the sword. You see, without the belt to hold the sheath, and without the sword, there would be no weapon for them to fight with when they go into war. So close your eyes for a second, and imagine the soldier running into battle, and as he's running, he gets to grab his weapon, but his weapon's not there because he doesn't have his belt on to carry it. Therefore, it becomes ineffective. The Nelson Study Bible says the belt hung also strips of leather to protect the lower body. And the Matthew Henry commentator says the belt secures all the other pieces of armor together. You see, truth should hold fast to us as a belt holds fast to our body. So what is truth? John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. 
Jesus is the perfect example to us as what truth is. God's word, the Holy Scripture, and his promises and his commands are all truth, plain and simple. We may try to make them shift a little bit here and there, but what is written in here is truth. And we need to hold fast to that every day. We need to check ourselves with God's word. During this past political campaign, you probably heard on the news, they kept saying, well, that's a fact checker. Are we checking their facts? Are we checking ourselves with the ultimate fact this morning? We need to carry the truth into battle. You see, if a belt that has that metal piece that goes into the holes that keeps it from falling down, and if that one little metal piece is broken, the belt is useless. We need the whole belt, not just parts of it. Just like we need to carry the whole truth into it, just not bits and pieces of it. If the truth shall make us free, then the lies, the lies that is opposite of truth will bind us up. Satan wants something more to feed us with lies so he can bind us up. If he binds us up in fear and, and sin, and then he has beaten us. So we must carry God's word so we know what is truth and what is not. John 8 verse 36 says, Whoever the Son sets free is free indeed. Some days the devil might tell you, you aren't good enough to witness to your friends or to your family. Or you aren't pretty enough or popular enough for that promotion or for this or for that. That's all lies from the enemy. Truth says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Truth tells us that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Truth says, I am the head and not the tail. So this morning I encourage you to stand on the truth that you know. And when Satan tries to throw those things at you, remind him what is true. The second piece of armor we need to also wear is the breastplate of righteousness. You see, the breastplate is a central part of the Roman soldier's armor as well. It protected their torso, which contained vital organs like our lungs and our heart, which we need to keep living. Without the breastplate, a soldier would be asking pretty much to get killed in battle as any attack would become instantly fatal if it got hit in the lungs or in the heart. But with a sturdy breastplate, the very same attacks would become ineffective and useless as the, as the blows would lance off the armor. Proverbs 11.4 says, Riches do not profit in the days of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. You see, without righteousness, we leave ourselves open to almost certainly death. With righteousness, just as with the breastplate, the otherwise fatal attacks of our enemy are reflected. So what is righteousness, and whose righteousness should we be wearing each day? Psalms 119 says, My tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. So to be righteous is to do what is right in God's eyes. God's commandments are righteous. So to be righteous is to obey God's laws. Are we walking out in God's laws every day? And whose righteousness are we wearing? There's a saying that says, don't be self-righteous. Isaiah 64 and 6 says, But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade away as a leaf in our inquiries, like the wind have taken us away. You see, righteousness may deliver us from death, but whose righteousness are we wearing? Are we wearing our own righteousness when the scripture says we're like filthy rags? Because filthy rags aren't going to protect us from the enemy. That's going to make a really lousy breastplate. But Jeremiah 23 verse 6 says, In his day Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is by his name, by which he will be called the Lord of our righteousness. You see, true righteousness comes from God and God alone. It's not our own. We must have God to protect us and defend us against Satan. It protects our heart. We must keep our heart on God. It's a vital organ. If the Satan can get to our heart, he's also won the battle. So we must protect our heart this morning. And so after we have our breastplate on and our belt on, we need now to put our shoes on. The shoes are the gospel of peace. Imagine a soldier, he's fully dressed for battle, he has his armor, his shield, his sword, and he's running into battle, then he falls and trips over a twig. 
That probably seems strange to you, right? But without your shoes, we're going to fall on things and hurt our feet. A shoeless soldier could run into battle and be in trouble without these. So unless you're fighting at Heinz Field on AstroTurf that may not hurt your feet, it's going to encounter some debris. It may be twigs and pebbles, but to the barefoot that can cause serious pain and injury. And the last thing that we need to worry about as soldiers running into battle is what we're going to trip on or walk on. So basically, our shoes allow us to step freely without fear, and while we, while we turn our attention to the battle at hand. So what is this gospel of peace? Matthew 4, 23 says, And Jesus went about Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Jesus was the perfect, uh, perfect example of what peace really is. He taught about the gospel, but not only did he teach about it, he showed it by praying for people, laying hands on people, seeing people healed of diseases. Are we being a representation of Jesus right now? Romans 10, 15 says, And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Church, this morning, we are supposed to be a church that is sent to announce the good news of God's kingdom to all who will listen. This is how we spread the gospel of peace around the world. Having our shoes on, we are ready to move, to spread the good news to others around us. We must spread it in Davidsville, and in Johnstown, and Jerome, and Holsapel, in Richland, and Boswell, and Hooversville. But we have to be ready to be sent out. We can't do it just sitting here. You see, Paul walked countless miles in delivering the good news to people. He didn't have a car or a motorcycle or a bicycle, but he walked countless miles to deliver the gospel to people. So what is our excuse? You see, today we have transportation and communication that can reach across thousands of miles in an instance. But are we spreading the gospel? We must be ready to pour out the good news. Romans 3.17 says, In the way of peace they have not known yet. There are people out there who do not know the peace of God because we aren't telling it to them. You see, in spite of all human attempts at peace, we as humans have failed at making peace with one another. It's clear from the daily news reports that there's not peace in this world like we all hope to see. 1 John 2.6 says, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. We must follow Christ's example and share like Christ shared. And then we need to learn to also stand firm with our shoes of peace. See, John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. If you see in the picture behind me, the sandals of the Roman soldiers, they have nails and metal pieces sticking out of them that were fitted so when they got into war, they would hold their ground and not be moved. God's good news and the great commission to preach the gospel should be our mission to go into the world. And that should be our firm foundation. If nothing else, let that commission be our firm foundation. You see, there are people in the world around us who need to know the peace that only the gospel can bring. But they're not going to know it unless we share it. So what are we doing as individually, individuals and families and as a church to share the peace of the gospel with those in our sphere of influence? I'm just as guilty to not sharing it when I should. But we would see more people wanting to know more about Jesus, so we say we serve, and we start walking it out. We must start wearing our shoes of peace and start walking it out as well. So once we have our belt on, our breastplate on, and our shoes on, and we're ready to go, we then need our shield of faith. You see, up until now, Paul's description of the armor of God has been limited to the items that we only wear. We put on our belt, we put on our breastplate, and we put on our shoes, and essentially they hold themselves up. 
But the shield, the shield is different. We must take something up. We require to raise it up. Just strapping it on our arm won't do us any good. We have to make the effort to hold it and use it. You see, the Roman shield was not the standard shield you would see in those movies that's a circular item. But the Roman shield was very large and slightly curved and rectangular. It said it was about three feet long. And at the center of it is this metal knob, and it's called the boss. B-O-S-S, -S, the boss. The shield was an impressive line of defense. Because of its size, it was able to protect the soldiers from the enemies. Because of its slight curve, it was able to deflect attacks without transferring the full force to the person holding the shield. And because of the metal piece in the middle known as the boss, it was able to deflect even the more vicious blows and function in a limited offensive way, meaning it was able to knock people backwards as they came forward. Are we using our faith to deflect things from Satan this morning? Hebrews 11 one says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. Ephesians 6.16 says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. A shield deflects. You see, Satan is always trying to fire these darts at us of fear and of doubt and worry in our direction. But the only time that they can hit us is when we let them hit us. It's when we have our shield down. When we stop believing that God is in control, when we stop believing that he's working everything out for our own good, and that whatever happens is for his ultimate best. We need to quit believing that he's out of in control because he is. You see, when our faith in God's power and care is strong, it is impossible for Satan to break through our shield and land an attack on us. We have to learn how to use our faith. Matthew 4, 10 through 11 says, And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and only him you shall serve. And the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. You see, a shield can also push backwards. When Christ was being tempted by Satan, his faith in the word and commands of God pushed Satan back. The boss, the metal piece in the middle of the shield, is known to push your enemies back. Our faith in God, it demonstrated by Christ, can also give Satan a good shove backwards so they can get ready for the attack. Scripture tells us that faith cannot just be in our minds, but it must produce action. Is our faith just talk or are we producing action this morning? You see, we can't just have dreams and a vision of greater things, but we must walk out our dreams and our vision. And sometimes it's hard to do that, but if we say we have faith, then that should be easier. You see, we just can't stand anymore and wait for the devil to start swinging at us and just protect ourselves. But we also must move forward in faith, pulling the enemy backwards and getting ready to strike. We must learn to live by faith, walk by faith, and we need to learn to stand in faith. And can I tell you, when we do those three things, the enemy's not going to be able to push us back like he has been. So once we have our belt on and our breastplate on, and we learn how to use our faith properly, we need to put on our helmet of salvation. You see, the helmet served the Roman soldiers like a helmet serves us today. It protects our heads from things that might try to hurt it. Satan wants to hit you in the head and mess up your mind. If he can get to your thoughts, he has control over us. So we need to put our helmet on. The Bible says that when we are born again, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, we are given a new mind, the mind of Christ. So we can receive tremendous hope and comfort by focusing on the incredible sacrifice that Christ gave us through his death and resurrection. You see, there is a kingdom waiting for us greater than what we know here on earth when we get to heaven. So let that be a hope for us. Let our helmet protect our minds from the discouragement and despair of this world. 
Without the helmet of salvation, we are unprotected from the things that Satan will throw in our minds. He will fill our thoughts with feelings that are not of God. Imagine not knowing what the future ultimately holds. The worries and problems that may produce by living in this world would overwhelm us. And at times, they do still overwhelm us. But let us remember, we have a salvation in Christ to fall back on. And that's something that no one can take away from you. Psalms 27, 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? We must protect our mind from the enemy. And do that by having a renewed mind. Because if he gets our mind, that leads to our heart. And if he gets our heart, he's won the battle. So now that we have our armor on, we're fully prepared. Now we have to go on the attack. And we go on the attack by taking the sword. The sword is the only item listed by Paul that serves an offensive capacity. Even if we have all the other armor on, but we're not equipped with our sword, we're nothing but a moving target for the devil to try to shoot at. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a moving target without something to fight it, out, to fight it back with. <laughs> You see, the Roman soldier's sword was made for close-range combat. And in the hand of a skilled Roman warrior, it could do more damage than you could only imagine. It could slice through flesh, and the point of the sword could pierce through even heavy metal armor to get to the vital parts of one's body. The sword of the spirit is is for attack, not for defense. The other armor that has been given to us is for to protect us. But the sword is for us to fight back with. You see, a real army is one that attacks the enemy. If we are in this world to just defend our faith, then we will be defeated. We have the greatest weapon that the world has ever known, and that is the Word of God. So why aren't we using it? The Word of God is not given to us to sit in our bedstands and get rusty, but it is given to us to deal with every problem and answer every attack that might come our way. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. But you know what, church? The sword is only as good as the person using it, though. We have to practice using our weapon. We can't grow on our own. We need to grow in the Lord and use his word. And we also need to grow together as one army. You see, swords are used for close combat, not for long-range warfare. Could this apply to the battle that we are in today? Too many times we shy away from facing issues head on. The, The weapon that God has given us is meant for close combat. That's how we run forward attacking the lies of the enemy with the word of God, instead of shying away from them. Paul only lists one weapon because we only need one weapon. There is no enemy the word of God with his Holy Spirit cannot defeat. So armed with only our sword, step out to fight our enemies head on. You see, the struggle is real, and it is immediate, and it is in front of us. Our future in God's kingdom is on the line. And we take up the battle so we may hold fast to the future that his, that his promises have for us. So what promises can we stand on? We have the promise of hope. God tells us that there is hope in him. Matthew 24 says, But he who endures to the end shall be saved. I think sometimes we forget that hope. Romans 8 verse 31 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can stand against us? You see, church, we fight knowing the end story. Two of the many powerful and short promises in God's word tell us that if we we remain dedicated to God, we will make it to the end, and we will be saved. So why do we doubt? God told Isaiah that in Isaiah 46, 11, he says, Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. 
I have a purpose for it, and I will also do it. So we have no reason not to believe that God's going to follow through. So take up your sword, church. The battle is ours. The last thing we as warriors dress for battling to do is we need to pray. Prayer is a direct line to our commander-in-chief, who is God and the Holy Spirit, and they are giving us directions on what we need to do and where we need to go to get the strength we need to keep fighting. If you need strength, then fall on your knees and pray for strength. If you need reinforcements, pray for God to send his Holy Spirit to reinforce us every day. And maybe our plants aren't the right plants. We need to pray for an audible. God will change our plans, so we need to be willing to go with the flow. But church, we can't do it on our own. It takes an army to win a battle, not one soldier. We can win physical battles alone. We can't win physical battles alone, and we can't win spiritual battles alone. We need to encourage one another. As iron sharpens iron, a friend also sharpens a friend. If you see this picture behind me, these are Roman soldiers marching together as one unit. And as they march together as one unit, as one army, they can take ground. We must work together as a team, like the Roman soldiers did. We must be willing to listen to our commander to give us orders and move together as a team. You see, church, we need to fight as a team. We need to hope together and have faith together as one army and as one team. Can I tell you, there is hope and faith this morning in this church, and it's alive. Two weeks ago, we signed the board meeting, and Mark Cable gave a devotion on faith for our church. Three days after that board meeting, we had a worship event here at Kaufman, and what a beautiful night it was. And as we were praying together in the fellowship hall, Pastor Keith came up and prayed for us. And after the worship service was over, one of the worship members came up to me and said, I need to tell you something. When your pastor was praying over us, I opened my eyes and I saw an angel standing behind him. And I asked God, what does that angel mean for this church? And that was an angel of hope. We need to stand firm in our hope that God has given us. It's how we stand firm in, in hope and in faith together as one army, as one unit. It's how we take back the ground that the devil has taken from us. It's how we stop being so much on the defensive and go on the offensive. It's how we speak truth into the things that the enemy has tried to hide. It's how we stand in faith and in peace that God is in control. It's time to rise up and be an army that takes back what the devil stole from us. It's time to be a church ready for war. It's time that when we walk into places, we walk into them with the gospel of peace. It's time, church, that we carry the sword of the Spirit and we use it daily to combat the enemy. It's time, church, that we hold fast to the promises of God and our salvation. It's time to move forward and tear down the walls of the oppressor. It's time we fight for deliverance in our homes, in our jobs, in our schools, and in our churches. It's time we pray for our governments and our countries and for this world around us. It's time we pray for the leadership of this church and we stand together as one unit and as one team moving forward. No more just talking about praying. No more talking about just standing up and putting on our armor. But it's time that we actually do it. It's time for action this morning. It's time for action this morning. So I'm asking you this morning, if you're willing to put your armor on, and if you're willing to fight and stand firm and declare freedom for the captives, are you willing to do that this morning as a church and as a body? If you're willing to do that this morning, if you're ready to fight in God's army, I'm asking you to stand up this morning as one body and as one army, declaring that we will take back what the devil has stolen from us. Don't wait to look around to see who is standing beside you. But if you're willing to stand and fight for what you know that God has given us, then I'm asking you to stand right now. Don't take blows back. Today, let us declare in one voice, as one army, as one team, we will not shut up, we will not be quiet, and we will not back down, and we will not give up hope for our families and for our church. But today, we stand ready for what God has called us to do. Will you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you have given us the battle 
We know that the war is already won, Father God, but we have to stand and we have to fight through it, Father. And so today I declare in Jesus' name that we are an army of one and you are our commander and we are ready for war, Jesus. Lord God, I declare hope and a future over each and one of us in our families, in our lives, in our work, and over this church, Father God. Lord God, we are the head and we are not the tail. And so today we declare freedom from the captives and from the chains that hold us back. Lord God, we will not shut up and we will not sit down anymore, but we will go fighting through the day. Lord, we will fight for those sitting beside us and around us. Lord, we thank you that the battle is won and the victory is ours. In Jesus' name, amen.